Welcome to the New Books Network. This is Lily Gorin with the New Books Network, the New Books and Political Science podcast. Today I'm joined by Sarah Rushing, who's the author of The Virtues of Vulnerability, Humility, Autonomy, and Citizen Subjectivity. This was recently published by Oxford University Press in 2021, and it is a fascinating and really important analysis of how we think of ourselves as citizens in a place that you might not think of yourself as a citizen um, when you encounter yourself with regard to health care um, in a variety of different settings. But I'm going to let Sarah talk to us about that. I'd like to welcome Sarah Rushing to the podcast and ask her to tell us a little bit about this project and how she came to it. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about the book today, Willie. Um, as you and I were chatting about just before we started, my book does have a preface, which I guess is unusual for a political theory book, although I did not know that at the time. Um, <clears throat> but it didn't originally have a preface. Originally, some of the personal anecdotes um, that uh, I think gave kind of um, a backstory to why I came to this topic were buried in the text. Um, and when I submitted the book to Oxford for, for review, the, um, one of the reviewers said, you know, these are, the, these are really interesting ways into this story and you really should put them at the beginning. And so I took that really literally and I put them in a preface. <laughs> and, uh, and I do think it's important. I mean, I, I think when I think about political theory, what makes it meaningful to me is that it brings together um, concepts, philosophy, uh, intellectual history and real world problems that we're grappling with. So for me, the problem always sort of drives the text. And so it it felt natural to put the problem that kind of led me into this topic at the beginning. And, um, and, and for me, it was, you know, very personal experiences with giving birth myself and with my brother being diagnosed with mental illness and struggling with that, and then ultimately committing suicide at the age of 25. And those were two um, moments that were, you know, about um, uh, six years apart in time, but uh, represented some of my first real um, uh, forays into the medical industrial complex, as some people call it, the mental health complex, the, the um, hospital land USA, the clinic, um, where I came to understand what it means <clears throat> to be learning in real time with stakes that feel very high um, about things that are really quite mundane and every day. Uh, I mean, certainly giving birth is really profound if it's you, but it's mundane in the sense that it happens <laughs> pretty much around the clock. Um, suicide is totally traumatic and profound. And yet, you know, when you've had this experience in your family and you share it with people, you realize how incredibly common it is, not ever mundane, but common. And so these are things that are happening to people all the time and that we often aren't talking about. And we're certainly, I think, not talking about those things as political theorists. So for me, they gave rise to a whole way of thinking about agency and freedom and relationality um, that ultimately found um, its, its form in this book. Uh, but I appreciated the reviewer who nudged me to put some of those personal stories up front because I would probably have nudged someone else to do the same thing. But when I was the author, I felt a little like, um, you know, you don't lead with this, you know, warm people up a little bit first. <laughs> but um, I'm ultimately glad that that's where it appears because I think it gives kind of an emotional tenor to the book and shows the stakes and the stakes are very real. Yeah. And in in opening up the book to read it, and I was confronted with that, the preface, and it's so beautifully written. Also, the book is very lovely to read, but the preface in particular, I could hear your voice Mm -hmm. and, and it, it takes me through your experiences, you know, sort of contending with the grief that followed your, Mm -hmm. your brother's suicide, as well as, you know, as you talk about, you know, suddenly you are learning how to give birth. And, you know, all of us who have had that experience, and then they hand you the baby and send you home. um, (laughs) After like having take taken care of you um, (laughs) in the hospital, it's quite an experience. And your argument that you're making in terms of thinking about ourselves as citizens in these contexts, in the hospital, in in care, um, in working with others to care for somebody that we love. I again, it was kind of like a duh, but I had never thought of it. Can you explain uh, about how you started to conceptualize this question of autonomy, citizen autonomy, in these contexts? Yes. Yeah, so. 
<clears throat> excuse me, I'm glad you mentioned grief because um, when I reference my brother's suicide, of course, that's in my mind. But for people who haven't read the book yet, they don't they don't know that. So I'm talking partly about navigating mental health care with him, but partly about navigating grief after his death and and really having to learn, you know, at 29 years old, what it means to live in a totally nonlinear way, which is not at all comfortable to me. And, you know, it's probably not comfortable to many people. Um, but having to understand what it means to live in a sort of a cyclical and um, kind of wave-like way for a couple of years and what that means for thinking about oneself as like an agent, someone who has um, intention and direction and charts a course. I love the um, Judith Butler quote that I put in the preface that talks about how we really can't go through grief by way of the Protestant ethic. And when I read that quote, I thought, but why? <laughs> why not? But of course, I understood fully what she was saying by the time I read that book and um, a, a Precarious Life. And um, and so that was a really kind of profound lesson in understanding what it means to not be able to control everything. When I had my first child, I, I went to hosp- the hospital and I had very mixed feelings about it, but I knew it was the right place for me at that time. Um, and my way of kind of managing those mixed feelings was to be the best patient I could be. <clears throat> and that meant learning as much as I could and, you know, having a birth plan and being very organized, but being very organized within the very specific parameters allowed to me by the kind of labor and delivery world. And so I was going to be the best, you know, A plus student <laughs> in that context, having allowed the agenda to be pretty much set for me and the menu of choices to be set for me. Um, and, um, so, and that meant making certain choices really well, even though they were choices I didn't really like. So that was a, a particular experience. That was my first child. And um, ultimately I had very good care and felt fine about that experience. But when I had my second child, I decided I wanted to do it at home. And I had a whole different experience giving birth. Um, and it was a much more authentic experience for me of, of making choices that felt like my choices and making them in total partnership with a midwife who sometimes said, no, I don't think that's probably a great choice for you. And then having to really work with her to decide what we're going to do. But it felt very collaborative and very, it it felt like a form of really supported autonomy where I did feel free, but not because I was able to do anything I wanted, because that's not what giving birth is like, (laughs) right? Ultimately, your body's going to make some choices and you are going to have to ride that wave a bit. But um, I felt much more listened to, like there was much more time, like I was more fully myself. Um, like where I decided to do things that I wasn't so sure I wanted to do, I decided them in a real way under, um, you know, uh, the conditions of support, not um, pressure. And so those two experiences really helped me think about what autonomy means. Um, And particularly coming out of the context of grief and birth, how much um, genuine autonomy requires a lot of humility, Um, And so those were the two concepts that really came together to ground the book um, uh, and and allow me to develop this idea I articulate in the book of humility-informed relational autonomy, that these are not um, opposites, which is how they would appear to us in the classic traditions we inherit them from. So Christian humility being really, you know, submission to a higher uh, authority and uh, liberal autonomy being sort of, I'm most free when you stay out of my way. Uh, you know, that's more sort of the libertarian non-interference version, but very much our American version of freedom. Um, and really thinking that these, these concepts aren't opposites. And to the extent that we treat them that way, um, we're in trouble. And so I really um, wanted to think about how we refigured them as totally interdependent on each other. And um, the, my experiences of giving birth did all the conceptual work for me because I knew coming out of those two experiences, um, okay, this is how I think it works. And, and in this regard, you, you do sort of critique this, the word humility, um, not critique it, but you, you redefine it um, and you try to move it away from its grounding in Christianity, its grounding in sort of the, the platonic thinkers, its grounding in contemporary liberalism, um, and also bootstrapping the American version of it. Um, and you you land ultimately, or you get to a redefinition that involves Confucian political theory. So it's a bit of a journey, um, but I would love for you to just sort of go through why you went on that journey with that word. Yeah. So um, 
It's funny. I When I was first doing some of this work, I said, I think the project that's going to grow out of this is going to be the love child of Confucius and Judith Butler. And I said this at a a presentation at a conference. And I thought it was hilarious. And I looked out at the audience, they were like, what? <laughs> you know, so, so I do realize that the um, turn to Confucianism can feel a little um, like, oh, gosh, what just what happened here? And so some of the answer to that question is, is happenstance um, that I happened to do a National Endowment for the Humanities Summer Seminar when I was at the very earliest stages of what I didn't even know yet was this project. Um, and the seminar was on virtue ethics and Confucianism. Uh, and my reasons for doing that were largely um, wanting to spend the summer in Connecticut near my partner's family <laughs> So when we had a one-year-old baby. But also it ended up being this incredibly um, just luxurious intellectual experience. I mean, six weeks with a room full of philosophers and brilliant teachers, um, learning, uh, you know, virtue ethics, which I knew from being a political theorist to a certain extent, um, but learning it through the lens of Confucian um, political theory was just incredible. But what I really came to see was that um, in Confucianism, which is very practice based, right, you cultivate these inner internal dispositions by doing certain actions in the right way at the right time, sort of uh, very similar to the lesson that Aristotle teaches us in the Nicomachean Ethics. Um, but the practices I saw as all being grounded in a certain kind of humility. And there's not actually a word for humility in the Analects, in the in classical um, Chinese, which I don't speak, but I take the people who help me <laughs> with their translations <laughs> at their word. Um, but when I presented on this to a bunch of Confucian scholars that I thought you know, humility was the root of these other dispositions, they were actually kind of persuaded, even though they didn't start out that way. So I thought, oh, okay, that's great. So I'm not, I'm not ultimately a, a scholar of Confucian thought, but it made me really think, okay, there's a way to think about humility that does kind of extract it from what I think is sort of a problematic history for not so much, you know, contemporary life. Um, I think, you know, classic, the classical Christian conception of humility is perfectly fine for, for contemporary Christian life, but it doesn't fit um, very well with contemporary democratic life. Um, uh, and so I wanted to figure out how to come up with a conception of humility or kind of extract from a, a classical conception, something that helps us think about ourselves as contemporary citizens in terms of how we, um, practice being with others in a way that is ultimately productive and doesn't require that we have, um, you know, um, deep, uh, empathy with or love for each other, right? Um, it kind of comes to bear in in the absence of that sometimes, and uh, and is all the more important because of that. So that's where I got the conception of humility. Um, but it really um, helped me think about what it means to be a citizen. And as you mentioned, you know, I, I explore that question in the context of healthcare um, because I believe that within the clinic we do cultivate a lot of traits um, that have direct uh, like relationship to what it means to be a citizen, uh, processing information, uh, working with others, um, making decisions for ourselves, making collectively self-determined decisions. So I see healthcare as what I call in the book sort of a citizenship training ground of sorts. Um, but I also want to argue that this, this uh, set of traits, humility-informed relational autonomy, has huge bearing in the broader world um, as we are more kind of traditional kinds of citizens in the democratic polity um, because we really can't swoop in and in, <laughs> impose our will on the world uh, no matter how much we want to. When we work in public together with others, we have to um, be humble about it. We have to have a certain aspiration to freedom and we ha also have to realize that it's pretty fragile and we um, might not achieve it some of the time and that um, we can't just sort of like walk away uh, for the most part, we got to keep working together in some form. And I think that's a incredibly thorny uh, problem we're dealing with today. Um, I mean, and we are right now talking about the fragility of democracy in the United States. There's a letter that's been making the rounds this week from a hundred political scientists about the fragility of our democracy. And so you're entering a conversation that's, you know, sort of ongoing, obviously, but one of the things that you talk about that I found really interesting and um, and I also sort of heard echoes of it in um, a colleague of ours, Sonali's work on the jury, um, is like here is a, a space where, as you say, it's sort of a citizenship training ground and one that we're inevitably probably going to encounter because we go to a doctor or we have a baby 
or, you know, a loved one is passing away um, or, you know, whatever the situation is, we are going to find ourselves in the clinic setting. Um, and so you sort of talk about how this is a place where as, as somebody entering into that, who has a problem that needs solving, um, like we would ask a representative solve this problem for us. Um, how, how do we understand our citizenship there and why is it also, um, problematic in the clinic? Yes. Particularly. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I mean, I think, I think most of us don't go into the clinic thinking of it as a site for citizenship training, but I think that's because we believe the clinic is a place of sort of interpersonal relations rooted in care for the patient and the patient's desires for their own care. And I do think that's a part of what happens in the clinic, but I don't actually think it's the majority of what happens in the clinic. And so part of my goal in this book was to really draw out for people who maybe haven't ventured into that terrain yet, um, just all the things that go into determining how we're cared for um, that are have nothing to do with the body um, or the doctor-patient relationship. So in you know insurance, the hospital board, uh, medical protocols, the basic... 24 hour day that informs how shifts work, right? All these things that go into our care that don't have anything to do with what the patient wants. So that's not to say that the, it's a big charade, but I do see our contemporary clinic being really saturated with what I call in the, the book, this discourse of choice and control, right? That if you're allowed to make a choice, that is your route to having control. And I just think that that is a really false promise and um, and it it kind of uh, brackets so many of these dimensions of our care um, that it's I think very important to understand. And if we do understand all the things that go into this medical insurance legal policy um, complex that is the clinic, um, then I think we're likely to think about how we make choices differently, ask different questions, um, know what choices we will and will not make. Um, learn to sort of say what happens if we don't do anything, what are the what are the benefits, what are the risks, right? That basic kind of decision procedure that I learned um, to, to go through in um, my childbirth training. <laughs> and then of course, when I was giving birth and my, my, my uh, doctor was recommending a certain procedure and I was like, great, great, do it. And my husband said, well, what are the risks and what are the benefits? And I was like, shut up. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes you learn all this stuff and it goes right out the window. Um, but I, but I just think that, uh, there is so much about agency and um, intention and support and the conditions under which we have um, genuine agency that is front and center in the clinic. Um, and if we don't go in having some sense of that, we're really going in blind. And and so you talk about this question of choice and control, which I think is really sort of the, as you note, the kind of um, mirror on the humility and autonomy sort of discussion. Um, but that choice and control also is coming out of neoliberalism. Um, mm -hmm. and that you have underpinning your analysis, the problem of neoliberalism. Um, and, and your analysis, as you know, there's, there's, you know, three focus points in the book, um, the birth experience and what happens in the birth experience, the death experience, um, and also the illness experience was specifically for veterans in the United States with PTSD. Um, and so how do we connect these very natural birth, death, illness um, with neoliberalism? Right. So um, part of what I think is really fascinating about neoliberalism, fascinating, fascinating and deeply troubling, is how much it, it imposes an economic idiom on every um, domain, right? So we become the consumer citizen. We become the consumer patient. Um, I talk to my students about how they've become the consumer students, right? Um, in, within the domain of the family, we become the consumer parent. So, so consumption and choices about consumption become largely um, the way we think about freedom, 
And um, so in healthcare, I think that that is also true. You know, what does it mean to be a patient today? It means to be someone who's a savvy entrepreneur who is um, can process um, uh, uh, information that they are empowered to identify on their own. Um, all of those same ideas about what it means to um, be a good subject, which is to be a good choice making subject specifically within the set of choices made available to you by whichever institutional setting you're in, the the university, the prison, the family, the school, right? The, um, the clinic. So, um, so I think that becomes very, very clear in healthcare where yes, we do have certain choices we can make. Um, and we should want to understand what those choices are and think about how we make them. And also, our choices are really delimited. Now, sometimes they're delimited by things that we don't understand are delimiting them and we ought to push back against, like insurance um, or hospital policies that are made with medical malpractice lawsuits in mind, not patient satisfaction, right? Um, but sometimes they're made um, because our bodies you know, have their own plans, um, we don't want to get cancer. And once we do, the choices available to us suck, you know, and that doesn't feel like choice. You know, if someone says, do you want to do chemo first or have surgery first, make a choice. You think that, that, that's not a, that's not a choice. Right. So, um, but, but that discourse is just pervasive. Um, I think maybe more so than other institutions we might look to. Um, and it, and that is the reflection I think of kind of the neoliberal logic today as it's pervaded the clinic. Um, that if people have a choice, then they have been able to um, be free and have control. Um, And so we're sold this bill of goods. And the thing that really fascinates me and kind of, again, was the emotional experience that motivated me to take up this question was how often we are very good at that. We're A plus choice makers. And then we go home and we think, oh my gosh, what, what just happened? (laughs) I don't, I don't see anything that happened there as an authentic reflection of me and what I wanted. I kept getting told it was all about what I wanted. And then I picked some things and now here I am. And I don't know what happened. Um, and, and, uh, you know, particularly, uh, in the birth literature, um, you see this with women who have C-sections that they basically consented to, but really didn't want and spend a lot of time wondering if they had to have, and then sometimes there are totally unambiguous C-sections where it's like, yeah, there's no question. I'm not going to rethink that for a minute. That was absolutely the right life-saving thing for me to do. But I think there's a lot of gray area, despite the fact that we don't go into birth knowing that. Um, in death, I think a lot of people uh, really um, consent to a, a intensive care up to the very end and then think, why did we do that? <laughs> we said we weren't going to do that. You know, my dying parents said they didn't want that. And yet somehow here we are in the ICU. Um, And with PTSD, you know, the context that grabbed me was how often um, veterans found themselves in these um, forms of therapeutic treatment that they just didn't want to engage in at all, Uh, particularly like um, prolonged exposure therapy, which involves reliving your traumas as a way to try to grapple with them. Also, you know, intense um, pharmaceutical cocktails, um, and, and basically sort of saying like, I'm not doing this. Uh, and so, you know, when you look at the veteran context, the dropout rates from these quote unquote gold standard treatments are incredibly high. Like it, so in all of these contexts, I don't think we're doing a good job at how we birth, how we death and how we treat particularly, you know, PTSD, but all kinds of illness and mental illness. And yet we keep doing them the same ways and even more so, right? Uh, We're getting more interventionist. We're getting more managerial. We're getting more technocratic, not less. And and so this whole discourse of choice and control, it it just doesn't, doesn't make sense. And yet it is our dominant logic today. And so it does make sense. Um, and yet there's this massive disconnect. So. Well, and we're so used to that, right? We're so used to the idea of choice, meaning that we have some autonomy over what's going on. And, you know, as you say in the book also, you know, you wanted somebody to tell you an answer and they kind of refused. And, and, you know, sometimes when you're sitting there, you're like, why are you, why are you not helping me make this decision? Because you're the one who went to medical school. Um, but, but I'm giving you a choice. In- right. I mean, the flip side is sometimes we don't want a choice. 
Um, and I found that really interesting in reading some of the um, midwifery literature from Scandinavia and the UK that there's this conception um, some scholars had developed of what it means to relinquish autonomy as a form of autonomy. And it, it really only works as a form of autonomy when it comes in a trusted sort of time built partnership with someone to whom you choose to relinquish autonomy, you know, typically uh, in the context here, a midwife um, and how that actually that giving up choice feels like the more authentic form of autonomy than getting to make all these choices. You don't want to, or know how to make or have the capacity to make in a totally um, embodied moment of disembodiment, right? <laughs> and and so in in this regard, also you talk in the book about you know again this this idea that we are citizens in this situation where we may be in pain um, emotionally or physically. Um, we you know we don't want to die while giving birth. Um, this seems to be something that modern medicine has solved. Um, and, and so we want that. Um, but we do have, you know, we do find ourselves in a sort of situation where we start to uh, realize, Hmm, do I, you know, is this something that I want to do? As you say, is this a choice that I want? Is there more information I can get? And you call it an awakening. Um, Mm -hmm. and it's a kind of citizen awakening in an unexpected place and in unexpected ways. Um, and this is a through line, you know, in terms of what you are talking about throughout the book and all of the situations. Can you explain what you mean by awakening? Yes. So, you know, um, as I mentioned in the book, <coughs> excuse me, there is a long history of talking about awakenings in African American political thought and other areas. For, for me, my um, sense of this concept emerged more out of feminist theory and this idea of, you know, consciousness raising um, that you can have kind of uh, what in feminist theory, you know, they call a click moment where all of a sudden you go, wait, wait, what? (laughs) Right. Like uh, a new eye opens. Um, But I think that for a lot of people, this is what happens in these um, deeply embodied and incredibly vulnerable moments within healthcare where they're kind of doing their best. They're going along, they're listening to information and they're making their choices. and, and, And they suddenly think, no, <laughs> no, I don't, no, I don't want to do that. Or, or, you know, there must, there must be some other way to do this, right? There must be some other way. And, um, and suddenly they have just sort of a different perspective on the system as a whole, right? I mean, sometimes we have these moments where we decide, I, I don't like this doctor at all, and I'm done with that person. And that might be a kind of awakening. <clears throat> but I have more in mind this perspective we get on the system as a whole, <clears throat> where we suddenly understand, like, the forces at work, that have led me to do my best, the best that I can, making these unfortunate choices or choices I, you know, I don't know how to make. And 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 yet I I now realize why why are we doing this? Why is this being put on me in this way? Who's in charge here? <laughs> right? Like, so that's that moment of sort of consciousness raising that I think has um, potentially long-term political implications. And again, someone who has a great experience you know, it navigating the VA mental health complex or hospice care or whatever, they, you know, they're not going to necessarily have that moment because there's no consciousness that needs to be raised for them. That's fine. I mean, they're not really my target audience, but I don't, I don't diminish their experience. <laughs> you know, I don't think they're being duped. It's great if that works for you. I think the numbers show that patient satisfaction in our country is often incredibly low. So I think for many people, it's not working. Um, and um, some of them come out and they just feel really terrible about what happened, or they have you know trauma from birth that lasts for a long time, and they blame themselves. But some people have what I think of as this awakening, where they think, no, I, I'm not, I don't, I'm not playing this game anymore in this way. So that might not entail anything different about your care, because at the end of the day, there might not be much you can do. Um, but for some people, I think what we see in the context I looked at at least is they, they quote unquote exit or they walk away, right? They pursue alternate forms of care. Um, and that that's uh, an act of resistance. It's not just sort of a, an economic choice making. I don't like this product, so I'm going to use that product instead. I see that as an act of resistance um, because it emerges from this moment of awakening where they sort of see the system for what it is and decide that it's not it's not a system they want to be entangled with if they have the option to not be entangled with it. And, and so again, as you know, it's, it comes from feminist thought. It comes from 
Um, you reference um, Jack Turner and some of his work on African-American thinking on sort of when African-Americans have awoken to their citizenship, but also the, the, you know, the essentially oppression of them as citizens within the United States. Um, and the exiting is also really a market term um, in terms of like, we exit the market and do something else. Um, I'm not going to buy a Subaru. I'm going to buy a Honda. I'm exiting the Subaru market. Um, and how how does this take place? And still, how are we able to, again, remain healthy? Yeah. So part of what I look at in the final chapter of the book, and it's something I'm now grappling with for sort of a subsequent project as I try to think about our current moment, anti-vaccine vaccine activists and anti-mask activists, right? People who are um, sort of refusing to participate or, quote, opting out of these public health care regimens. So I'm grappling with this question of what it means to exit. Um, but in the book, I, I you know, get to this point where I want to distinguish opting out, which is this kind of preeminent neoliberal um, choice making, so very economic, to exit, which I want to give more of a political um, valence. And, um, and I think there are other scholars who I reference in the um, the conclusion, Janet Kirkpatrick and um, Mark Warren, among others, who are sort of looking at how exit is not just an economic act, but is a political act when it isn't just choosing between two, you know, equally viable products. One of, It's not just Coke versus Pepsi. I like this one better, right? Um, I refuse to drink Pepsi, right? Well, who cares? Whatever, you know, <laughs> like, but when it um, comes from a, p- a place of resistance to systemic dynamics, um, so sometimes that gets communicated back to the system. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, but they really want to explore walking away um, as an act of protest. And so, um, you know, part of what I, I, I don't, you know, I don't do empirical work myself in this book. I rely on the copious empirical work other people have done in the context of, you know, birth, death, and illness, largely medical anthropologists and sociologists who have done a lot of really, um, you know, on the ground ethnographies of these areas. I rely on them. But to a certain extent, it's an it's a, um, empirical question. When is walking away <clears throat> protest? <clears throat> Excuse me. When is it just... Um, uh, I, you know, I did, I, I gave birth in a hospital this time. I'm going to have it at home this time. Cause I just, you know, I'm just curious about that. Right. No, nothing again. I'm nothing against the hospital. I think it's perfectly fine. I just want to try that. Right. So that's, those are different kinds of acts. Um, and one strikes me as a form of kind of, uh, citizenship and one would be more consumer. And, and uh, I, and again, you know, sort of, you took us through mm-hmm. as, as readers through the different, components of this in the three chapters. And, um, and you note obviously that birth is something that's been going on as long as humans have been around. So, or before, because animals also birth. Um, and that again, death is pretty much with us. Um, and, and so that to sort of look at those places as where this, you know, political engagement was happening in a way that people aren't aware of or become aware of in their awakening. But the, the, the third example, the third case study, I found really intriguing that you looked at veterans in the United States specifically um, and their relationship with the VA, which is a public health institution, um, and their experiences around post-traumatic stress disorder treatment. Mm-hmm. Um, and that this is, it's thorny, um, in so many ways, but you also talk about it as an anxiety area because of, you know, disabilities that are seen and unseen and injuries that are seen and unseen and the wounded warrior mantra that we have. Can you explain how you came to this case study as the third, um, I, it's fascinating and, and really important to think about, but I just wanted to know how you got there. Yeah. Well, I knew I wanted to do some form of illness and I, I decided I wanted to do mental illness because I wanted to make a pitch for mental illness being illness, right? Um, <clears throat> which I think we know it is, but it often gets, um, sort of, uh, invisibilized, um, because, as you mentioned, we tend to treat it as unseen, even though, you know, if you know mentally ill people, it can be very seen and they want to be seen. Um, 
but I think I get, it's funny that you asked me, how did I come to the veteran I mean, part of it was like, I, you know, it was, I live in Montana. I know a lot of veterans who go to my university students. We were very active in recruiting veterans. Um, and I, and I'm also, you know, um, deeply hopeful we don't produce a lot more veterans because we're doing such a bad job with the ones we have. Um, and I, you know, the more I sort of thought about mental illness and, and PTSD in particular, which is the, the, you know, the thing that many of my veteran students struggle with, um, the more I wanted to think about, well, what happens when you take people who are already in some way public citizens, right? Their life is very public. They're very intricately linked to the state. <clears throat> Their injury is in a way on all of us. Um, and yet we're um, totally negligent it, as a country, I think, and how we're addressing that. Um, and they're navigating a healthcare system that's totally different. So, I mean, the VA is the only socialized medical system we have in the United States. And, and you know, um, there's a kind of public uh, discourse that says, oh, veterans hate the VA. Well, actually, veterans for the most part, like VA care, they don't like the waits. Um, and with PTSD, the waits have been prohibitively long and the treatment has been um, f- uh, in flux, right? Dominant uh, treatment regimens have changed over time and um, they can be hard to access and many veterans don't like what they entail. But in general, uh, the VA is really interesting because the veterans who I uh, consider through you know, a lot of the secondary literature I read who exit the VA to pursue uh, what I sort of lump together is natural remedies. So um, yoga, wilderness immersion, and marijuana. Um, they don't want to exit the VA as a whole. <laughs> and uh, and some of them actually want to re-enlist and serve future tourists. So their, their, act, of, their act of leaving um, for me had to be considered in kind of a different light. Um, what does it mean to exit a certain dimension of, a, of an institution, but not more of it? Or to say, I don't want to be subjected to these forms of mental health care, but I still want to be able to come get my antibiotics and everything else. Um, and if marijuana becomes legal in the state I live in, I want the VA to allow me to use it without you know, uh, charging me with federal drug crimes and taking away my health care. So it's a whole thorny complex that was very different from my looking at birth and death. Um, but yeah, there was no like moment that um, brought me into that topic. I did at one point think we have a group in Montana called Warriors and Quiet Waters, and they use fishing uh, as a way of bringing veterans to kind of a place of peace. Fishing is also um, a really accessible sport for people who are um, mobility challenged in terms of like, if you can't walk, you can sit in a boat and fish. And so it's this great organization. And I thought when I started like, oh, I'm going to do all sorts of interviews. And of course, I realized that was totally arrogant and like probably kind of irresponsible because I don't, I'm not really trained to do qualitative interviews at this stage. I do hope I get that training and can do some interviews down the road. But I found a lot of great secondary literature talking about wilderness immersion. Um, and so it was a local context for me and a problem that I don't have a personal connection to other than my students and my state. But I do think we all ought to see ourselves as having a personal connection to it because there are veterans. <laughs> Right. They, 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 you know, fought on our behalf Mm -hmm. and yes. Um, And I, you also bring into the discussion uh, in that chapter um, more of a sort of conversation around health and masculinity. Um, Mm -hmm. Because again, the, the invisible um, disease, the invisibility of PTSD is also something that works against some of our consumption ideas of like, this is a healthy body and Mm -hmm. this is a strong body. And oftentimes that leads to it also being a male body. Right. Um, Can you explain a little bit about unpacking some of that? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's so funny because when I tell people the title of my book, The Virtues of Vulnerability, Often if I'm talking, I mean, this is so, you know, gender stereotypical in a way, but it's nonetheless true. Often if I'm talking to a woman, I'm sort of describing the book, they're nodding. Um, and, and you know, I've talked to a couple men I know um, who are, you know, roughly my age and they're, you know, 40s who have kids. And they, they're looking at me like, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. Or one guy actually said to me, are there actually any virtues to being vulnerable? And I thought, yeah, you. I don't think your body has encountered this world yet, and and maybe your mind hasn't either, or maybe you have deep anxiety about it, and that's you know its own thing. But um, but I thought it was really interesting, and so the veterans context I think tackles some of that 
by taking these most sort of masculine of cultural um, archetypes and showing, you know, um, what happens when you have to live through, you know, physical decimation or mental decimation, um, and how, um, how really how much humility it takes to find your way back to a kind of autonomy in that context. But also, what I want to say is how paradigmatic that is, right? So p- part of what I want to do in this book with all these chapters is say, yeah, maybe you're never going to give birth, or or haven't, or don't know anything about it, and maybe you haven't escorted someone through dying or, you know, confronted your own mortality. And and maybe you'll put that off for a long time and, you know, engage with it only in a very brief and, you know, superficial way. Who knows? But we are all vulnerable in these ways. These really aren't outliers. These are totally paradigmatic dimensions of what it means to be human. Um, And, uh, you know, nobody enlists to fight for their country, to think that they're going to come back and have to travel this path for the rest of their life. And yet, overwhelmingly, it's happening. So I think, you know, my goal was to show that vulnerability is constitutive of humanity. And, um, and that if we could get our heads around that, um, and really internalize that message, we would think about humility and autonomy differently. And we would think about citizenship differently. And we would think about life differently. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, <laughs> I really, really appreciated the way that you talk about the fact that we are all generally disabled at some point or in some ways, um, and that this is a lot of the disability study that, you know, sort of norming the the straight white male body or straight white female body as able um, mm-hmm. is actually an outlier. Right. Um, and that if it's age, if it's, you know, I'm sitting here with the cast on my foot because I had surgery. And so I'm currently, you know, disabled in a way that I'm not usually, um, that the able body is, is a misnomer. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, it's, it's great if you get to enjoy it and you should, you should enjoy it thoroughly. Um, you shouldn't, it as a norm and then sort of other everyone who doesn't reach that standard. But also, you know, I look at my students and again, um, you know, primarily my male, you know, white 21 year old students who are, you know, in the context of Montana backcountry adventurers or downhill skiers. And, you know, they are living their embodied life to their fullest, but they're also completely confident that A, they're entitled to that and that B, it will last forever. <laughs> and I think part of what I want to say is, Oh man, enjoy it, but also recognize that it's a precarious achievement and it could be taken from any of us at any time. And that, you know, will could feel tragic in the moment, but also it's just a part of being human, right? We all, you know, if we live a full life, fall in love and get our heart broken. And that that's being human. <laughs> you know, that's how it goes, the good and the bad. And so I, I guess I, I really wanted to make a pitch for the fact that out of these moments of extreme vulnerability, some pretty amazing things can flow if you'll let them. Um, but that that's a real shift in consciousness, particularly in the context where you know impenetrable masculinity is the ideal somehow we're all supposed to be achieving, white masculinity. Yeah. And and that, you know, if if we can sort of allow ourselves to be open to vulnerability that it's not scary. I mean, I think that's a lot of what you are sort of talking about is that if we change our thinking, it's really not scary. It's something that we can flourish in um, because we also do it collaboratively. We do it with others. We do it in community. We are doing it as citizens, which I I found a really important teaching in the book. Um, And I just wanted to ask you, because we've now lived through a pandemic, (laughs) <laughs> um, or at least hopefully many of us have lived through the pandemic that in reading your book, obviously it went to press, you know, sort of at the beginning of the pandemic, I'm assuming. Um, but what is your thinking on our responses to the pandemic in context of your analysis? Yeah. I mean, I'm so glad it was done before the pandemic because I think it would have you know, necessitated additional chapters, which I don't know, you know, wasn't probably prepared to write at the time. And I'm not yet prepared to write, but I am thinking a lot about it. I mean, you know, part of um, what I do in the book briefly in the first chapter is, you know, look to Hobbes for thinking about um, uh, sovereignty and this conception of the body politic. And, uh, you know, I've thought a lot in the last year about 
Hobbes talking about a body politic divided against itself. And he uses all these maladies as metaphors to think about that. So he really is getting into sort of the nitty gritty of the body um, and, and how to think about um, a body politic not just in terms of the citizen subjectivity we cultivate in the clinic that we then bring back to the polity, but in terms of public health initiatives that make demands on the polity. And of course, that's what our past you know, 15 months have been defined by. So, um, so I do think that's a subsequent project for me to think about how um, the thinking I've done for this book either kind of is developed or can be developed in the context of the pandemic or is challenged by the context of the, the pandemic and the the kinds of um, uh, relationality that I'm kind of calling for, but is so thoroughly breaking down, at least in public life today. Um, so how do we think about um, the virtues of vulnerability when we have such um, such deep polarization where the idea that we would collaborate be interdependent on each other, uh, be totally, like, literally porous to each other, uh, poses such a, such a total threat to our lives, you know, not just our psyche, not just our agendas, but our lives. So I think that's an, a subsequent project. Um, and, you know, I think one of the um, kind of conclusions I wanted to draw out of this book to go back to the premise um, is that if we undergo vulnerability in a certain way, we may engage with each other and think about our future and aspire together differently. Uh, in the book, you know, in the preface, I talk about grief. And really, I think I had a moment where I thought, well, I can either shut this grief down <laughs> and just go about my life and it will probably give me a severe ulcer or cancer later, but okay, I'll deal with that later. Or I can just stop my life and let it wash over me and fall completely fall apart and then come back together as whoever I am after that. And with a ton of support um, and love and help from friends and family, that's the path I traveled. And I'm really so much fuller a person after that endeavor. So my message is, yeah, there are virtues to vulnerability and we can undergo these losses and this pain and these challenges and be better for it, be stronger for it. Having said that, I'm not sure I feel that way about our public life today. I'm not sure there's anything good that's going to come out of this long term that makes us stronger together and better for it. I'm not confident about that at all. So, um, so I don't know. It kind of maybe puts that question of the virtues of vulnerability <laughs> into play. Uh, but it's a question I'm still interested in, and I hope to pursue it further in so the context. That was my, my last question, of course, is what are you working on? And so is this the next project, or is that, or is that <laughs> the project after the next project? Or <laughs> Yeah, so this is the next project. And the way that I am able to sort of enter into it at this point uh, is as a political theorist firmly uh, at, at, as a conceptual project that looks at um, this past year of uh, the kind of uh, 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 uprising of anti-maskers and anti-vaxxers um, and, um, and tries to think about those movements um, through the lens of the concept of health libertarianism. So taking this concept of libertarianism from political theory and looking at what happens when that political ideology is put to work in medical context. So, um, you know, I think up until the last year and a half, we've tended to think about um, people who are anti-vaccine activists. And this isn't vaccine hesitancy, and it's not we want more information or longer testing. I mean, there's all sorts of reasonable ways to quarrel with our, you know, public health vaccine, um, you know, schedule. So I don't, I don't think that quarreling with the vaccine schedule is per se um, kind of anti-statist, right? But the way we've seen it take shape in the last year has shown us, A, it's not fringe <laughs> anymore, and B, it's, it's highly anti-statist. So, um, so to think about what happens, not so much when people have medical concerns or medical challenges that they create uh, into a health activism movement and bring to the state to challenge, but when they have political quarrels that they take into the clinic and that that's a different, that's a whole different ball of wax, I think. So, um, so that's my project, sort of piece apart some of the things that have happened during the course of our pandemic, not so much in terms of our personal health decisions, but in terms of our public health decisions um, and try to reframe them outside of the dominant terms that those groups themselves have claimed, vaccine choice or medical freedom, but to reframe them as something that I want to help us think about as health libertarianism. And if we get our heads around it in that, as that 
idea, how does that reframe our thinking about how to engage with it? So that's the next project, but that's about as far as I've gotten on it so far. <laughs> so. Well, you've, you've got the working outline of it. So when it becomes another book, I hope to talk to you about it on the New Books Network. If you will, if you'll send it my way, I'd love to do that. Um, and I want to thank you, Sarah Rushing, for joining me today to talk about the virtues of vulnerability, humility, autonomy, and citizen subjectivity, published by Oxford University Press in 2021. Is there a brick and mortar store with a online presence that you would like to give a shout out to? Um, well, m- my country bookshelf local store <laughs> is one. Um, and I believe if you want to order directly through Oxford University Press, which is not a brick and mortar store, they may still um, offer a discount for the book, which is only out in hardcover right now. So it's a little pricey, but I'm hoping to get it out in uh, paperback relatively soon. Um, and would appreciate anyone who wants to buy it. And in the meantime, have their library buy it. So, yes. Thank you yeah. so much for joining me today, Sarah. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Yes, I really appreciate the opportunity.